Hi, you are watching. This story follows a man who gets transported into a game he was playing and reincarnated into a god named Nebula, and he has to battle 27 other gods to become the sole ruler of the planet and reshape it according to their vision. In the previous chapter, Owen and Hui had arrived at the Lizardman's camp, where they were greeted by Rakrak himself, but since they are still mourning the death of Stargazer, Rakrak wanted for Hui to get straight to the point. Honoring this, Hui presented a significant portion of salt, a token from the Lord of Automation, indicating a proposition for diplomatic relations. Unexpectedly, Rakrak showed no interest in the gesture, expressing his desire for Hui to depart. Confused, Hui sought clarification on Rakrak's dismissal. In response, Rakrak emphasized how he hates liars like him the most, which caught Hui by surprise. But before he could argue, Rakrak told him why that is. They were not the first one Hui had visited like how he had initially claimed, as Owen had reported that he came from the north, and that is where the Ears Cut tribe were located. And the other lie was that Hui wasn't an errand boy of automation, but the lord of automation himself, Hui Xiu. Now on to the next part. Automation, which was an ancient fortress ruin, was over five meters tall and shrouded in mysteries. It had a real rampart that could not be found in modern times, and at the earthen rampart of automation were mysterious mud soldiers with self-repairing function, which allowed them to automatically rebuild the castle in the event that the castle collapsed. The mud soldiers were slow and unintelligent, so they were not very useful in battle, but in emergencies, they could be used as troops to defend the castle. Furthermore, automation was not just home to a salt mine, but also had geographical advantages. There were two routes to get from the north to the northwest of the peninsula. One was to go through the wilderness, and the other was to pass through a rugged mountain valley below the automation castle. The average vagrant would be hard-pressed to pick one over the other, but those who knew both paths well usually preferred the mountain valley. First, even though the path was rugged, it was easier to pass through and less dangerous than the wilderness, which was easy to get lost in. Second, the mountain valley was the shorter path. And last but not least, it was because automation was there, in the wilderness. Once a vagrant ran out of water and food, they would have to pray for a spring to appear as a miracle. But automation, on the other hand, at least gave water to vagrants. That meant, automation could cut off the way to the inner region of the continent. Their castle itself did not completely block the middle of the mountain valley, but if automation had enough troops, they could pressure those who passed by the castle. So even though the black-scaled lizard men and automation had a neutral relationship, if the humans of automation believed they could benefit from even a single betrayal, they would do it. Past the mountain valley was a path leading to the north and northwest part of the continent, and Nebula is cautious about the continent in the northern region. That's why he need to secure the automation for himself. And the supposed Lord of Automation is right in front of Rakrak, yet Hui neither confirmed nor denied this, remaining silent and unfazed by Rakrak's speculative assertion. And so Rakrak shared how he came to this conclusion. He figured it out because of the name Hui, and he used this name on purpose to test how much the Lizardmen know about automation. Still, Hui stood silently. So Rakrak continued, It is said that the Lord of Automation hides himself and his true name, and is simply known as Lord. However, that's only outside of Automation. He had heard there are four families that serve the Lord of Automation. They likely act as the hands and feet of the Lord, yet only a few of them know the Lord's real name. Those who share the same blood as the Lord all have Hui as part of their names, and that the Lord has four sons and three daughters. However, the Hui in front of him is not a woman and by the looks of the wrinkles on his hands, says that he is not that young for a human either. That's how he figured out his name, Lord of Automation, Hui Sio. With this, Hui acknowledged that Raycrack had truly read him like a book, so he took off his leather hood and fixed his posture. Now that the act was busted, the man with the responsibility and authority to lead the people of Automation faced Rakrak at the same eye level. Hui Sio's face was completely revealed. It was the face of a middle-aged man, with fierce eyes rimmed with wrinkles and a shaggy beard. He was fairly skinny and had a scar on top of his nose, which looked like it would have been a big cut. Hui Sio then asked Rakrak, how did he know this much about his family, especially since he was certain no lizard men were among his close associates. However, he quickly brushed aside his curiosity, prioritizing the matter at hand, and so he sat down and asked the other reasons why Rakrak had declined his offer. In response, Rakrak revealed a smile, as this the third reason he's about to say is also the reason why Salkite had declined his offer and that there's no such thing as a gift without a price, a truth he firmly believed in. Even that greedy sulket can discern that much. Hui Sio attempted to reassure Rakrak that he is truly giving them salt for nothing in return. But Rakrak already knew from the get-go that this was a lie, because if they accept his salt, they have to protect them, 
Because whenever they are confined and surrounded in the automation castle, the lizard men will have to worry about the safety of their salt. If the lizard men play along with their diplomacy and they get in trouble, the lizard men would have no choice but to pay attention to fights that have nothing to do with the lizard men. And that what diplomacy is, and that's why he hates it. And if Rockrack puts it like that, Hui admits that it's not necessarily a gift for nothing in return, but they are making a decent deal, so he can't understand why he is declining their offer just based on the third reason. This made Rackrack laugh, as he was sure that Salkate would have already told him why that is. Why wouldn't they just take over automation? If they kick out the humans, the salt mine and the automation castle will become theirs. Hui was stunned at first, but he suppressed his anger, and asks Rackrack if he was saying that he is going to attack them, to which Rackrack answered that they would not, He's just saying that would be better for them than making diplomatic trade or whatever it is. Hui argued that humans were not as defenseless as Rakrak presumed, and Rakrak countered that he never said they were. What he is saying is that if his calculations are correct, they will be able to take over automation, even though they will suffer a little casualty. And he is well aware there are other secrets within automation that he doesn't know about. That's why the humans are able to stay there for so long without losing their home, and he does worry about how much his warriors will suffer due to that secret. However, Taking over automation wouldn't be a problem, and that is because they follow the blue insect god. If god helps them, that tall rampart and all the mud soldiers will turn into debris. And Hui couldn't think of anything to say. Rakrak was right. Hui had heard about the guardian Stratus. It was a giant mantis monster that would disappear after helping the black-scaled lizard men fight difficult battles. The mantis was known as one of the incarnations of the blue insect god, and wooden statues made after its likeness could also be found at the market in automation. And there's more problems aside from Stratis. The black-scaled lizardmen have a cockatoo warrior, as well as the chosen ones. He is not sure how much power they have, but even if one chosen one used their power, it would demoralize their soldiers. There aren't many who wouldn't be afraid after witnessing thunder and lightning strike right before their eyes. Even putting aside all those variables, there were still many other problems. Most of all, if what they've confirmed is correct, Rakrak has around 80 warriors, and there's probably more and reflecting on the military might of automation, Hui recognized a stark disadvantage. While they have a big population, only a handful were capable combatants. Other than the four warrior families serving the Lord of Automation, there were no proper soldiers. The other so-called soldiers would outnumber the black-scaled lizardmen, but they weren't blessed by a god. There's an even more important matter. If rumors spread about a fight breaking out, many would run away. A great percentage of the humans within the ramparts were farmers, peddlers, miners, and their families, and they relied on the ramparts to protect them. They were the ones that made automation wealthy. But wealth alone couldn't protect automation. If they began to leave, or more precisely, as long as it seemed like they were going to leave, the soldiers would lose their confidence. And word of the brutalness of the Earscut tribe has started to spread. But the stories of the black-scaled lizardmen are already well known. Probably because of people like Owen, he should have been careful with him. With this, Hui had to admit that he had lost this war before it even began. He wasn't sure if Rakrak knew what he was thinking, but because it seemed like he doesn't have question to asks anymore, Rakrak felt that it was his turn now, and so he inquired if Howie isn't afraid of coming here alone, to which Hui admits that he is, but just like how confident Rakrak was in believing that they can take over automation by force, whether his real identity was caught or not, he knew that he would just let him go, and even if Rakrak didn't know who he really was, he knows that black-scaled lizardmen are kind to guests, and Rakrak admits that Hui is not wrong. But as he had told him before, the black-scaled lizardman tribe would benefit from attacking automation. And the way he sees things, the four families will panic if the Lord of Automation dies. It'll be easy to win a battle without a commander. And with that, Rakrak asks Hui once again why he should just let him go. But Hui Seo didn't even blink, as he confidently say that it was because Rakrak wouldn't know who his successor will be if he dies. Rakrak stood up straight again and slightly rolled up the tip of his tail, as if he'd heard something that piqued his curiosity. So Rekrak asks why Hui thinks it matters for the black-scaled lizardmen to know who the next successor of Automation is, and what does the successor to Automation have to do with them. Hui thought about how to answer it more clearly in a way that Rekrak could understand it in an instant, and so he decided to use the game of Go as an analogy. It's a popular game at Automation, where they draw several crisscrossing lines like a grid, and then collect white and black stones and take turns placing each color down one by one, but the rules of the game are not the point. What's important is that he knows that he is a stone on this board. And Rakrak's pupils contracted and his eyes seemed to twinkle, as he was visibly impressed by this human's capability. Wiseo then added that he knows the game has already started, and it's a game where two gods are playing with their own tribes as stones, and the wilderness is the board. One god brought gnolls, and the other god brought lizardmen. 
The gnolls and lizardmen on that board have started a game of their own, and that game is called Automation, and Rockrack's silence was confirmation enough. Just like how the lizardmen knows about him. He knows what they are trying to do. They were already involved in deciding on the succession of Automation. Recently, the lizardmen have approached his children. From some point on, they've been talking about teeth full of anger, and others talked about a blue butterfly, and his children have begun to believe in gods. Meanwhile, Rakrak eyes glow in the shadow as he acknowledged that the human in front of him was as skillful as him in reading someone's intention. There was no point in denying now. The human's analysis was accurate. The lizardmen had already involved themselves in the succession war, and so Rakrak admits to Hoi that he was right, and this was the best choice possible, since this is less damaging for them than attacking automation. Rakrak didn't think taking over automation would be easy. It was a castle built from soil but the tall rampart surrounding it was way taller than an average person, so it was a difficult obstacle to overcome. Even if the lizardmen were to attack the rampart, they would have to brave through all the arrows being shot at them from afar, the wooden fences in front of the rampart, the rocks being thrown at them from the top of the rampart, and the spears that would try to stab them. If they want the salt mine, it would be better to go about it in a way where they wouldn't see so much blood. Rakrak didn't think this way when taking over the northern parts of the peninsula. This was because the black-scaled lizardmen hadn't been considered a large tribe back then. In addition, Nebula also had his own reason as to why he didn't think forcing others to convert was a good idea. As Nebula was searching for his second species, so he couldn't waste his faith points on useless ones. Therefore, he didn't recommend Rakrak to propagate God to anyone other than the lizardmen. As his divinity level rose, he had an abundant amount of faith points, and there was a need for Nebula to switch to a two-species system. He preferred playing with flexibility in builds. However, he needed to choose right away. And unlike his first choice where he just had to find a tribe to use within his area, the second choice would be crucial in determining a player's strategy and progression of builds in the future. Some say that the first species is just a segue to discovering the second species. Those players would find their second species, transfer all the skills of the first species to them, and stop making use of the first. That kind of strategy was necessary for some games but it definitely wasn't one to be used in this case, because his first species did better than expected. Nebula wanted to find a species that could support the Lizardmen, and potentially expand the tribe for his second choice. And since Nebula plans to take over the southern part of the peninsula, where he needs to cross both enemy lines in the inner continent and northern coast, he needed a species that were relatively good at handling the cold since Lizardmen gets cold easily. With this, Nebula had to choose between the Orcs, Elves, Gnomes, and Humans. And with consideration, weighing the pros and cons of each species, Nebula had decided that humans would be the best choice. Unfortunately, another player was thinking the same thing as him. And so, three weeks ago, the clash of civilizations had commenced, and Nebula thought about what he should do, as the opponent wanted to face each other and have a conversation. This was a problem for Nebula, as everyone had different preferences when it came to chatting in online games, and Nebula always preferred not to talk to anyone. Chatting with other players could also be a strategy when playing a game, but Nebula thought it was better to use that time to control another character. However, this time, it seems a conversation is needed. There's nothing else he can do. So Nebula accepted the request. This way, it's possible to get more information from the other person than simply chatting through messaging. And the player revealed to be Hegemonia. And since he is the one who's late to arrive, Hegemonia started the conversation in a casual manner like how close friends would do. But Nebula didn't have the most amiable personality, and he doesn't feel the same way as Hegemonia does, and so he told Hegemonia to not act like they were close, and Hegemonia became somewhat embarrassed. Still, Hegemonia argued that he just greeted him like this since they have encountered each other in the game quite a few times. They even played their last game together before coming to this world, which Nebula confirmed that he remembers, but they have been here for ten years, so it is only natural to not remember everything that happened, which flabbergasted Hegemonia as he insisted that their last game was such a good one and was worth remembering. This prompted Nebula to revisit the memory of their last game to make sure if Hegemonia was right, only to conclude that it was so boring. He remembered that he countered his Holy Orc meta strategy and Hegemonia lost. It should have been a close game for it to have been a good one, but the game just ended like that. With this, Hegemonia looked down and grabbed their helmet, hiding from embarrassment, and Nebula thought Hegemonia was probably a soft-hearted person in real life. Unlike what the Avatar would suggest, Hegemonia then raised their head and declared that he had made up his mind. This time he will be the winner, and put an end to him for sure. It seems like Hegemonia truly never changes, always saying stupid things. So, he asks him why would they fight now. In case he had forgotten, 
Nebula reminds him that there won't be a next time once they started a war. This is their reality now. The Lost World is basically a free-for-all, multifaceted game. Everyone is fighting for their lives. But he just suggested that the first and second ranked players to lose at the beginning. A war of annihilation between two strong players was something to reconsider. In the Lost World, how the game was played in the beginning determined how the middle and second half of the game would turn out, and small losses in the beginning of the game would sometimes return as severe damage towards the end. Even if they could make up for the small losses, there would be no way to catch up if the other players had advanced far more in technology. And if both parties expended their resources in the conflict, it doesn't matter who won, the winner would be eliminated right after. In response, Hegemonia scratched the side of their head, which didn't suit the Avatar at all, as he admitted that he just got a little carried away. But that didn't seem true to Nebula, as he remembered Hegemonia's playstyle. It seemed simple, but they had an animal-like instinct in conflicts, and he was good at multitasking. And when Nebula looked up Hegemonia on the statistical site in real life, it stated that Hegemonia benefited from fighting others in the beginning of their games. Nebula also thought he could do that, but there's no reason to follow a strategy advantageous to an opponent. In the end, chatting was also a part of the game, and in this round, Nebula won without his opponent even realizing it. He successfully manipulated Hegemonia to suggest a different method in determining the winner of their match, which Nebula agreed as this was what he wanted, and since it was clear what they both wanted, putting automation and humans at stake, the two players decided to play a contradicting prophecy. Hit that like button and thanks for watching.